welcome to What's Cooking. Can you hear me? Okay, good deal. All right, my name is Suzanne, welcome. We also have Willard over here and Spencer behind the camera, so you are stuck with the three of us yet again. How many of you, um, this is your first time coming to What's Cooking? We have a few new people, wonderful, welcome. And thanks to all of you who are returning, we appreciate that. I have a few announcements that I need to get through before we get into our seven ingredients or less, but I wanted to go over a couple of things. As you are all aware, Spencer has put together the cookbook from last year, and we appreciate those of you who have picked them up. We have three people who pre-registered for them, Paige Parker, Susan Rando, and Jean Miller. If you're here, um, the friends over there have yours. You just need to pay them. And there's also one extra one if somebody wants to grab that today. They are $10. If you are interested in one, we will make more. So all you need to do is sign up with the friends sometime today. Um, so we have an idea. Spencer will make more, and we will have those um, at our next class in April. So they are $10, and they're all the recipes that we covered last year for the What's Cooking program. Um, there is a master class, another master class coming in April. That is Spencer and Willard, and they're doing Mexican salsa. So the registration for that class opens on March 21st, and that class is here. It is a, sm a smaller class, and they're going to have two classes, um, one at 10 and I think one at 12. But that registration will open up on March 21st. So if you're interested in salsa making, you might want to sign up for that one. Um, the class is April 18th, which is a Thursday. Our What's Cooking class for April is April 6th, and that's going to be um, vegetarian and herbs. So if you're interested, that opened up this morning. So I can, one of us can register you later today when we have time, or you can go online at any point and register for that. Um, that is on, that's the Saturday after Easter, because Easter's early this year. So it will be after Easter. And the other thing, um, is it May 15th, or March 15th for the photo, or April 15th, March? Okay, so the photo awards, for those of you who are, have been following online at the library, the photo awards, people submitted photographs and they were judged, and the photo awards are on March 15th. So if you are interested in that, all of that is on the library and we can give you some information. There's, the pictures are online and they are going to be up, they're up at the library. I haven't, I haven't seen them currently, but I know they're, they're going to be up there. So that's my main pieces that I needed to cover. And then Spencer is going to cover, there is a class coming up in April, um, cord cutting, and he's going to talk more about that. So if it has to do cord cutting, so streaming TV, cutting the cord with your TV and some of those other things. So. <laughs> I'm going to let him talk about it because I have no idea. So he'll give you way more information. So cutting that cord for the, all the expensive TV, all that stuff that's out there. So as mentioned, my name is Suzanne. Um, and all of you that are repeaters know that I, this is like right up my alley, seven ingredients or less, because I'm the easy person who likes easy recipes. So I made two recipes today. Um, they are in your booklet on page four. So if you open up to page four. So the first one that I made is a blueberry crunch cake. So you can see there it is five ingredients, pretty much. I always have to buy the pie filling because um, I don't keep that around. But, and I always have to buy crushed pineapple because that's something I don't keep around. But the other three ingredients, I always have a cake mix in my pantry, always have butter, and I always have pecans in the freezer. So if I know I'm making this, I, there's two specific things I need to buy. I always use the blueberry pie filling, but you can use whatever kind of pie filling that you like best. Um, I've had it with cherry. 
I've had it with apple, but blueberry is the preference in our home, so that's what I stick with. So it is super simple. It is a matter of nine by 13 dish. You open up the can of crushed pineapple, juice and all, put it in. Open up your pie filling, put that on top of the pineapple. Take your box of yellow cake mix and then sprinkle that over the top of everything else. Melt your butter, third of a cup, or third, yeah, third of a cup, three quarters, thank you. I'm not, I'm like, third is not right. Three quarters of a cup, <laughs> melt that, put that on top, and then put your pecans. I crush my pecans, which you can buy crushed. I just always have the big bag of them. I crush them myself. Throw it in the oven for 45 minutes, 35 to 45. It, you know, 45 was what I ended up with yesterday. Comes out looking like this. So something simple, a nice, easy thing. You might be a little hesitant because I've made it before. People are like, pineapple and blueberries? But it, it works. Um, so that, that one's there. So like I said, you can use any type of pie filling that you want. If you prefer different kinds of nuts, I'm sure you could do that. Pecans are favorites in ours. But like I said, this one... I don't deviate too much because my husband, he was upset that I wouldn't let him. He's like, they won't even notice if there's a little bit missing. I'm like, yes, they will. <laughs> so had to keep him away from that one. And this one, the, the one in the crock pot, again, not much, dif much more difficult. This one has six ingredients. The biggest time-consuming piece for me on this one is chopping up the onions. You know, because you just, I like them fine so that they're just chopped up. So did that. You put, turn on the crock pot on low, put your chicken breast after I've cut off the fat, you know, all the little things off of it, just lay it in the bottom of the crock pot, put the onions on there that I've chopped up, and a can of cream of chicken soup. Now, I doubled this recipe so, for today, so that made two cans of cream of chicken soup. If you don't want cream of chicken, you want to use cream of mushroom, go for it. Any type of... If you want to use a different cream, that's not a problem. Then it's a matter of cooking up the box of Zatarain's yellow rice. I cooked that up last night, put it in the fridge. I added it in this morning. Of course, I did too because I doubled it. Drain a can of corn. And then the last thing that you do is add a cup of cheese to it, which I'm going to do when I'm done talking so it'll melt and that will be ready for everyone else. Again, something super simple easy um and i know everybody has chicken and rice recipes i have several chicken and rice recipes this one can you substitute in and use a different vegetable absolutely you know green beans if you want to do some broccoli anything that you're interested in i we again i haven't i've done the green beans once or twice but this is what he prefers and when i find something he likes and he'll eat and he doesn't complain about that's what i go with so so it's pretty simple so any questions on either of those? Like I said, not too difficult. Do you spray the pan before you put the cake? Um, yes, I did for that, just lightly because okay. with the with the um, the juice from the the pineapple and the blueberry, it, it's pretty. It doesn't stick too much. Yes. Did you say you tried something besides corn? I've done a can of green beans before, okay. and that that's worked. They don't because it's really, it's just putting them in. When you do the rice, the can of vegetables and the cheese, it's just to kind of warm it all up because it's all pre-cooked anyway. I mean, the can, because it's a can of, you know, they're already cooked through. It's just a matter of, of warming up, and they've been fine in there. Yes. Can you? I have, I have never done that, but you probably can. I think you might have to vary... Because some of that filling, it gives you that liquid from the pie filling, so that would, so that might change the variances of things a little bit. But I, I it's worth a shot. The whole I did, yes. I for this one, I used, um, I use about. I always buy my chicken at Sam's, and then I, you know, just pack, freeze the, put them in the pack, package them in the freezer. Um, what am I trying to say? You know, I just freezer bag them and they're all set. So we usually do one chicken breast, but for this one, I, 
you know, because I'm not going to measure out a chicken breast as exactly one pound. So this one, I bought three, uh, we, Hannah brought three, uh, three pounds of chicken because I knew I was doubling the recipe. But one you could do and you could slice it in half if you wanted, which I've done a lot, so, to, so it cooks faster. Once the chicken cooks, because the other time consuming piece of this is just shredding the chicken. Like I cooked it yesterday for four, I'm sorry and I forgot, I'm glad you, met, you asked about the chicken. Um, because that's the other time consuming piece is just taking the fork and shredding it. And then I just stuck it back in the, free, you know, put it in the refrigerator last night with that and put everything in this morning and it's good to go. Yes. I've never, I, I it probably could, I've never done that. Um, I, it would, you know, if you wanted to, for a little bit of time, I wouldn't do it for super, like, like months and months, but I think you probably could. And again, I only make it when I know I have people coming over because my husband as a diabetic does not, <laughs> does not need it around. So yeah, that is the big trick. Yeah. Have you ever just put all the raw materials in there and just let it cook all day long? I I have not with the rice because it has this one. I have with other recipes, but not this one. I I just sometimes it's hard with rice because it gets it gets mushy or it dries out, you know. And so by cooking it ahead of time, then I'm not worried about any of that piece, so it's just a matter of putting it in and warming it up. Anything else? Good question. All right, who am I turning it over to? I'll take it. Is it you, Willard? Yep. All right. All right, so. You're welcome. Again. So my name's Willard. We'll be looking at the uh, fried rice I typically make. Uh, so it's on page five. And fried rice is pretty common. I assume a lot of us have tried making different variations of fried rice. Mm -hmm. yep. So this is a very basic one. I tried to make this one more of a standalone meal. So a meal you can have for seven, seven uh, ingredients or less. Typically when I make it in the past, I will make it a uh, side dish. And I'll typically throw in like a uh, quarter of a chicken or something in the oven. And while that's cooking, I'll be making the fried rice. Uh, when I do that, I use a couple less eggs because I'm getting more than enough protein with the chicken, so I don't need all the extra eggs in it. But for today's recipe, I went with four eggs instead. And with fried rice, one of the things that almost every recipe will tell you is that you want to pre-cook your rice and let it chill down. And it's true, it does make the texture a little nicer, but when I typically make my own fried rice for myself, I will just put, throw it on the stove, throw the chicken in the oven, when the rice is done cooking, then I'll start immediately frying it up. It does change the texture. It makes it a little bit more mushy, but it tastes pretty much just the same, so I'm not really concerned about texture. So for today's, I went ahead and pre-cooked it overnight. So I did a batch of rice last night, threw it in a fridge after it cooled down a little bit, fluffed it up, and then this morning, around 8 o'clock this morning, started frying everything up. Um, so you can see step one is to pre-cook the rice. Step two is to heat the skillet with a little bit of oil. I like to use two different types of oil. I've made it in many variations. The typical one I used to use was just vegetable oil and then just use that for all of the frying. I found out that I like the extra flavor of sesame seed oil. So I'll use the vegetable oil just to fry up the eggs right away ahead of time. But then when I'm frying the rice itself, I'll mostly depend on the sesame seed oil and use just a little bit of uh, vegetable oil in there to just add a little bit more consistency to the oil so it doesn't all burn real quick. So basically you just cook your rice the night before or you can do it just the morning that you're making it or the afternoon that you're making it. Lightly scramble a couple of eggs, set those aside. I pretty much soft cook my eggs because I know I'm going to throw them again, throw them back in the skillet at the end. But if you want to go ahead and cook it to the consistency that you liked to use, just wait until the very end before you put your eggs in. So once I've got the eggs set aside, I'll go ahead and uh, heat the skillet back up, throw the oil in, and then start frying up the rice. Now with a lot of my rice dishes, I'll typically use brown rice. I just like the fact that I get a little bit more fiber with the brown rice. I get the bran. I get a little bit of fat from the brown rice. For this meal, I typically throw in quite a few vegetables. 
And so since I know I'm getting all the goodness from the vegetables, I'll just go ahead and use just plain white rice for my fried rice. So get that fried up. Only takes a couple of minutes to start to get it to fried because it's already been cooked. Um, then once the outer part of the rice starts to fry, throw in your vegetables. I've used uh, frozen packages mostly, but there's been times in a pinch where I didn't have frozen vegetables, and I've used canned vegetables, and it turned out pretty good. The only thing you want to be careful with with canned vegetables is to make sure you completely drain them. All that moisture will soak into the rice, and then you'll get a, just a big skillet of mush at the end if you don't drain it. Another thing to be aware of is a lot of vegetables are pre-cooked with a lot of salt. So you can either buy the reduced sodium ones or you can just cut back on the salt seasoning at the end of the cooking process if you're going to use the canned vegetables. So speaking of seasoning, like I said, I get a lot of my flavors from the sesame seed oil. At the very end, that's when I add a couple of extra seasonings, and they're not too much. Typically, I go with the soy. That's just what I was taught to, how to make fried rice. I've experimented with uh, some of the fish and oyster sauce, and I also like that. And there's been times where I've just had salt and pepper, so that's what I used, and it came out pretty good, too. So any questions about making fried rice? It's a very simple meal, and it only takes a few handful of ingredients. Yeah, I've got a question on uh -huh. how the scrambled eggs work in that. I mean, do they stay fluffy, or do they break Yep, up? since you're throwing them in the end, they're going to stay fluffy. So I'll lightly scramble them, and I don't even completely scramble them when I'm first cooking them up because mostly they're there for the look. I've even, on some occasions, just thrown in raw eggs at the very end and cooked those up. It will definitely change the texture and turn it into a much more of a solidified mixture. But most people will go with the pre-scramble. So scramble them up and then chop them up, throw them in at the end. You're basically just gonna reheat them and mix them in with the rest of the material at the end. Yes, so yep, so with a lot of um, stir fry, fried rice kind of things, they like to use a wok, mostly because the wok is a lot more forgiving at really high temperatures. Most of us use non-stick Teflon coated uh, cookware, and that does not hold up, hold up well to really high temperatures. So if you're a really adherent to cooking it the traditional way, You'll want to use either a wok or a stainless steel, typically coated stainless steel, that isn't going to have a surface breakdown like the Teflon will in a non-stick skillet. But when you're using a non-stick skillet, the big difference is I cook it at medium high instead of high heat. Anything else? Okay, oh, yes. Um, they basically burnish the outer uh, stainless steel on the inside, so it's got almost like a fine coat on it. It's not an actual coat of material. They burnish it, so and polish it up, and it kind of uh, smooths out all the pores. It makes it so that things don't stick to them quite as easily. My recipe this month is fairly simple. I think there was some jokes about can Spencer really do this in less than seven <laughs> ingredients. <laughs> I actually think I did it in four, so you guys should be happy. So mine's on page seven, it's the chocolate trifle. I've seen this done with like shortcake in the past, uh, with strawberries, vanilla cake, so I thought, well, let's go the other way with it. So we threw this together, it does not take long. What's nice about this, it's cheap, it's fast. If somebody calls you up in the middle of the afternoon and said, hey, I'll be over for dinner, and you're like, thank you for inviting yourself, let me pull something together, that never happens, right? So you can quickly go to the store, just grab a few items, or you may even have some of this stuff on hand, and just throw it together. Um, so if we look at the recipe, it's um, Cool Whip, right, frozen whip topping, now, you notice I cheated. One pre-made chocolate cake. That's how I got this to four ingredients. I didn't make the cake. So if you have cake mix at the house and you've got time to make like a 9 by 13 cake, you don't worry about icing it and all that stuff. Just bake it in the pan, let it cool, and then cube it. If you don't want to go through all that and, you know, Walmart, Publix, whatever, down the road, it's five minutes, just go get you a 
I think this is like a pound and a half cake we got from Walmart. I don't know how much it cost because our supervisor did all the grocery shopping, but um, it can't be that expensive. And then I just cubed it up. It was a fudge cake. How could we go wrong with that? So then we're gonna do, we're gonna add pudding to the trifle. How many were here for the pie class last year? All right, a couple of you. Do you remember the cream pie we made? We're using the same trick. For the rest of you who are looking at me like, what in the world is he talking about? When you get your instant pudding box of whatever flavor you want, in this case we're using chocolate, you read the back. It's going to say to put two cups of 2% milk. No. No. Don't even use whole milk in it. You want to go down the end of the refrigerator aisle and you want to buy the 36% heavy whipping cream. <laughs> Put that in there, give it a whip, now you got something. So that's actually what I used here. Since I had to use a few extra boxes for what I'm about to show you, I ran a little short of heavy whipping cream. The only thing I had in the house to make up the extra two cups was almond milk. So if anybody's got a nut allergy, I would say maybe stay away from this for today. But if you're home, if you don't have a, a nut allergy, I just want to let everybody know, just in case. All right, um, so then we got these things, right? Good old fashioned Oreos we've made all kinds of stuff with. You, this is a great project if you're frustrated. Throw them in a bag and go crazy with a wooden pin on them. You know, you just bang them up. And then one jar of chocolate fudge is optional if you want. So it's not really that, that um, complicated. What do you put this in? You can put it in a trifle dish, you can put it in a bowl, whatever you got. If you got a nine by 13 pan, use that, whatever you've got at the house. So I was talking, and Angie couldn't be here today. She's, she had some prior engagements. She says, well, you know, we've got that punch bowl we got as a wedding gift that's still out in the garage that we, I don't think we've even opened it. <laughs> Oh, let's use that. Okay, so I went in the garage and I found it. Don't worry, I cleaned it. It's actually a cake stand and it's a... It doesn't weigh anything, really. <laughs> okay, so this just comes off of here if you're not... It's just a cake thing, it's upside down. So you can kind of see the layering. I'll go ahead and wash my hands and we'll finish it here real quick. Oh, that's nice, it didn't stick. I'm not usually a fan of Cool Whip. I grew up, as you guys know, in dairy country, so it should be, you know, but whipped cream is stabilized, or um, Cool Whip. Okay, so there we go. Now we got nice clean hands. So again, you could throw this together um, ahead of time. This was actually done last night. Oh, tip, big tip. Um, so I had some leftovers. By the way, this took three tubs of Cool Whip, two family size boxes of pudding, basically a whole package of those, and then this like one and a half pound cake. So we used most of it. We had a little bit left over, so we decided we'll have a little tester at the house. So we took some small cups and we had like two cubes of cake left and we divided it for the four of us. I have not been to bed yet. Oh, Lord. This will wind you up faster than a clock. So just be a little mindful of that when you come up and get some or else you're gonna go to your grocery shopping today, you're gonna get it done in half the time. It's gonna be awesome, so all right. So there we go. If you're making a mess, you're doing it right. And so, and that's basically it. But you could swap this out for any kind of cake, any kind of filling. Again, like the strawberry shortcake. That's something my wife and I always fight about. She grew up having angel cake. I grew up having biscuits. That's always a fun time in our house. But um, yeah, any other questions? You could layer it um, if you're going to, now here's the other thing I found about chocolate fudge, if you leave it in the microwave too long. Yeah. Uh -huh. Didn't know that. Oh yeah. So, 
I would probably warm it very gently and then I would let it cool to mostly room temperature and then maybe put it on top of the pudding then that way it uh, the cake doesn't get totally soaked yeah that probably wouldn't hurt and you don't want the hot fudge to be actually hot hot because it will melt the cool whip hello there Mary Crapnow I made two ingredient dessert here so I have to give credit where credit is due. My brother-in-law calls me up and goes, you got to try this. So um, I did, and here it is. You use angel food cake and pudding. Get a bowl, you stir it up. It's like kind of uh, dusty type because the, the angel food cake is so fine ground. So um, I whip it up with a spoon, but then I use an electric mixer to try and get some air in it so that it rises up. Uh, I cook it uh, 350 oven, 35 to 40 minutes, and this is what you get. So nice and brown. So when it says lemon squares, it's kind of like not what you think about with the shortbread on the bottom and three hours of work. Um, this is like real easy. I got up at like going on four o'clock this morning, came out to the kitchen, turned the oven on, put it in, it cooked for 40 minutes, and I was back in bed by five. <laughs> so, you know, this is like real easy. One of the options, you can take powdered sugar and kind of put it on the top to fancy it up. Otherwise, I think it stands alone. Two ingredients, real fast. So, hope you enjoy it. I made the Peruvian mayonnaise, and uh, the, the thing is that it can become a dip. So in page six, you will, you're going to see that I gave choices of uh, olive, tuna, and tartar sauce. This is the tuna one, but the editor that I want to sue has <laughs> that the olives also. So you have two olives and olives. Uh, so the one I used was the, the solid white albacore. Don't use the chunk or the lights, and make sure that it's very drained. Okay? So um, the, the oil I use, it has to be, unless you want the, the flavor of the olives, the olive oil, which is the one I usually use, uh, uh, better use any vegetable one. The one I use is the, the canola oil, which has pretty much no flavor. And uh, let me see. The key word for the Peruvian mayonnaise is do it slowly. Despacito, like the song says. Despacito, you have heard that song, right? Hopefully. Okay, so um, I made the exact amounts that said in the wrote in the recipe, so you would see, but then to protect it from when I drove, I put it in here, and now I'm afraid to take it out because it's very uh, uh, tight. So I'm going to leave it there, and you can see. So if you need more than this amount, of course, you can double the recipe. Okay, so now, when I, because my, sometimes my English lacks some, some um, words, when I say there, uh, let me see. Remove the small lid. This is what I mean by the small lid. Uh, in a regular blender, you know, the, the big lid, and this is the small, because through that little hole is where you put the, the, the uh, oil very, very slowly. And other than that, not much. So when the mayonnaise was ready, I added the, the tuna fish and, uh, and blended a little bit longer. And uh, this is supposed to be, if you were in Peru, you will find it at room temperature. But because I know there are concerns here about the raw egg and, and that and that, I, put it, I made it this morning and I put it in the refrigerator. And you see, it just came out of the refrigerator again. I brought this kind of cookies because these are the ones that I know that have no flavor. So I, so I want the flavor from here. So if you don't like it, tough. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Oh, okay. Uh, one, can, one can, which is five ounces of uh, the, the tuna, but it has to be the white alba, albacore. It can be any kind of tuna, uh, but uh, very drained. That's you say in oil or water? Oh, I'm sorry, water. Thank you. Yes. Yes, because you have enough oil already in the rest of the right. recipe. Right. Yes, thank you very much for bringing that to my attention. Hello, I'm Tina Beer, and I'm going to make a two-ingredient recipe uh, biscuits. These are just like biscuits that you have for breakfast, biscuits and gravy, biscuits and jam, whatever it is. They're super, super easy to make, and I'm going to make them right now to show you how easy they are. So, um, the thing is that you can make these in any... Uh, size of a batch that you want. You just keep the ratio the same, 75% liquid of whatever the flour is. So it's just self-rising flour, which is important that it's self-rising flour, not regular, not bread, not all-purpose. has to be self-rising flour. The difference with self-rising is that it already has the salt and the baking powder in it. Um, different than Bisquick because Bisquick has fat in it, like uh, shortening or whatever. And we're going to get all our fat from handy dandy heavy cream. Yeah. Yeah. So self-rising flour and cream, that's it. So I'm going to make a double batch. In the, in the recipe book that you have, it's on page five. Um, it has two cups of flour. We're going to do four because we're going to do a double batch. <coughs> right? Two. Three. Uh, if you went to the Spencer School of uh, Measuring, you know this isn't an exact science. <laughs> You could weigh it as well. Just make sure you have the 75% ratio, you know. So we have four cups. So we're going to have three cups of cream, right? I wash my hands good because this is a hands-on mix it up. There's one. I know it's a lot of cream. I didn't say it was low-cal. Okay. So that's that. And then you can just dig in and start mixing oh, yeah. it up with your fingers and just pull it around. The thing is, you don't want to overmix this. Anytime you're making something that's like a shortbread type of thing, uh, you don't, you're not trying to beat it and beat it, you know, and, and get a bunch of air in it. It's going to be sticky. It's going to stick to your fingers like this. That's okay. But, and sometimes when you first start mixing it up, for me at least, I'm a little tempted to put more cream in it because see how, how dry it is? And you think, oh, that can't possibly make a good dough. But just be patient with it for a minute because uh, it'll start coming together. That flour will keep uh, soaking in some of that, uh, that fat and it, or the cream and it takes just a minute. So I'm going to go two-handed on this. Just a minute more. And once I get it uh, to where it starts sticking together more than to each other, more than my fingers, I dump it out on the table so it's kind of a shaggy mess. Just dump the whole thing out because then you can mix it a little bit better, right? So we're just going to mix it until all of that is incorporated in there. I'm making a mess. That's why I brought my apron. You definitely want an apron for this. But it really, truly comes together really quick. It doesn't take any time at all. I say that. Yeah. <laughs> and you didn't add any flour to help with the kneading. No. No. No, we don't want that. no. We'll put a little bit of flour down when I go to roll it out just so it doesn't stick to the table. And roll it, roll it back. Okay. So that's pretty much all incorporated. And see, I didn't add, even though you're tempted to add more cream, just walk away from the cream. <laughs> because you want it to be a dough that sticks together like this. And I'm, I'm done kneading it. It's, I mean, it's shaggy a little bit, but that's okay, right? Okay. So now I'm going to put a little bit of flour down. That's just so it doesn't stick when I roll it. Put it in a circle. Count it out a little bit. I have a marble rolling pin that I'm in love with. And you roll it out to about half an inch, maybe a little less is okay. Not a big deal, however you 
whatever thing you get it to. The important thing, though, is that we're going to roll it out multiple times because that's going to create the layers in it. So you take it after you roll it, half, rotate it 90 degrees, now roll it the other way. Same thing, in half, roll it the other way. So you're going to roll it three times, right? That's it. And so then you just put it on your baking sheet. This is a sill pat. This is a silicone baking mat that I love. If you don't have a sill pat, and they're not terribly expensive, and this is like a knockoff brand. Mm -hmm. I think they're just as good as a name brand, and the name brand's like three times as much money. You can just use parchment paper. So just cut it with a biscuit cutter. Cut a biscuit. And you put them on your pan, and we'll cook them up. If you don't have a biscuit cutter, you can use uh, cut out both sides of a soup can, or if you want to make little biscuits, a uh, tomato uh, paste can. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, that, you know, that tomato stuff. Um, put it on that, and these look like they're short little, you know, doesn't really look like a real biscuit, but they'll puff up when you cook them in the oven. So they'll be a lot fluffier than you think they are, and they have these nice uh, layers to them. So once they're on your sheet, then I'll do another little batch of these. Um, you bake them in, a, these have to go into a hot oven. So 425, it's pretty hot. You normally don't cook, you know, breads that high, but because of the way that these are with the fat and the self rising, you have to uh, cook them pretty quick and hot. So they cook about 10 to 12 minutes until they start to brown up a bit. Um, uh, 200 degree internal temperature and so you can check that internal temperature with this handy dandy tool that I know Spencer loves it's a thermo pen they're kind of uh, they're kind of expensive they're high um, but they're a wonderful tool they'll give you an instant temperature read in a doggone hurry okay well, I think I could fit a few more on here because we have a lot of people here and you all need biscuit <laughs> right? And we're all getting hungry. <laughs> Won't be long. Uh, okay, we get that one in there. So we'll put this in the oven. The oven's already preheated to 425. So it'll go for 10 up to 12 minutes. And then uh, when you have the rest of this, you can make some more. Roll it out again. Now you don't want to like roll this 100 times, right? Um, so maybe one more time just to get it into a dough that's usable. Oop, I messed that up. And then I also brought with it just some butter and I also brought some apple butter, which I didn't send uh, these guys the recipe for that. I probably should have because it's also under seven ingredients. You just take uh, fresh apples uh, core them and uh, take the stem off and the core out of it. But you don't have to peel them. It shouldn't peel them. Put them in a pan with some uh, white grape juice or apple juice you could use, but I like white grape juice. Cook them until they're soft. And then you just put in, um, put in your heart's desire of sugar, cinnamon. Mm -hmm. If you like clove, some people like clove. I personally prefer just cinnamon. Um, Put the cinnamon in there with it, sugar uh, to whatever your liking is, and then you just cook it down until it gets to a good consistency, and it'll get um, it'll get thicker, you know, as it cools off when you cook it. So you don't want it to be like super super thick, or it'll just be ucky uh, when you're done. And that's it. And you let it cool, mash it all up. You might have to peel some of the, take some of the peeling out uh, because it, the peel will stay kind of whole, but it'll give it that pretty brown color. Anyway, apple butter. All right. Okay, that's it. Yeah, we'll have to be good. Ask me if I said a time or not. You did? Well, you're too dandy. <laughs> that's it. And then my other favorite tool is um, my bench scraper because it helps with cleaning up everything. Uh, you can also, whenever you're making it, I should have uh, brushed some of them. You can brush the tops of them with butter if you'd like. Uh, 
or whipping cream, my bad, I'm sorry. Thank you, you're my good helper today. <laughs> um, yeah, you can brush the tops of them with cream if you want. It'll give it a little bit different texture on the top, a little bit kind of almost flakier, which seems counterintuitive to me because it's liquid, um, but it really does kind of make it a little bit more flaky. So that's it. So they'll be ready in a little bit. Oh, and when we take them out of the oven, we'll put them to cool on a rack like this. Because if you don't, those pans are hot and they'll continue to cook and you don't want to burn the bottoms of them. And you don't want to just put them on a flat plan because they'll get uh, steamy and get kind of soggy on the bottom. So you always uh, put them on a rack to cool.